So, with all due respect to our uh, eminent speakers and panellists um, for, uh, up to now, this is the, the real meat and potatoes of the, of the day because we are going to see actually the evidence um, and the outcomes of, some, of a film education programme and we're going to talk to some of the people responsible. Um, Aoife Donnelly, Avril Whelan, who are two uh, teachers from Granton Primary School in this city. Jamie Chambers, who's a filmmaker who's been supporting them. And then at some point, maybe course to five, five o'clock, young filmmakers themselves. Um, are going to come and we're going to watch, we're going to watch three films, one from each of three years of, of this programme. Um, but your children are going to come before Lobster Catcher, uh, and then we're going to watch Lobster Catcher, and then you can ask them some questions, um, which I think which is unusual and would be, would be revealing, um, we hope. Um, but the programme that, uh, that we're talking about in this whole session is called Le Cinema Saint Anne de Jeunesse. In, it, it's called that uh, in many parts of the world. In Scotland, it's called Understanding Cinema, uh, so it has its own identity. Um, I, I just, just tracking back to the previous session, I think the best way of thinking about this program um, is to think of it as an international film school, actually, um, that is in 15 different countries and counting, um, and is for 6 to 19-year-olds. Um, and it fulfills lots of the criteria that you would have for a film school. It has a curriculum. Um, it has a common curriculum, which is devised at the beginning of each year by lots of the participants, about 100 um, filmmakers and teachers, and, uh, and a patron, a kind of artistic advisor, a guy called Mr. Burgler. Um, and between them, between ourselves, we create, we, we ask a question of cinema each year. It, it's been going for 22 years, so there have been many questions of cinema that have been asked. It's unusual. In, in my experience of a film education program, that it, it's not following instrumental or um, pro-social uh, um, outcomes. It's, it's concerned with form and with aesthetics and with, and with film and, and the way that film operates. Um, so the questions of cinema are things like, why move the camera? You know, what a great question to explore with children, with young people, with filmmakers, with teachers. Um, what's the relationship between reality and fiction when we make films? Th those, those kinds of questions. So the curriculum starts with training in Paris for lots of, lots of people, but not, not entirely everybody, in September. Um, and then people go off to their various countries and they go to talk to their various um, workshop leaders and they pass on the training. And for, for the most part, it starts sometime in October or November and it runs either, sometimes very rarely, this is a really a rare exception, in school time. Um, didn't, not every year, didn't run every year at school time, did it? But, but in some, and I think in St. Charles in Glasgow this year, it's run in school time. Um, but in lots of places it runs after school, from October, November until the end of May. And it culminates in June with screenings, uh, lot of screenings in Paris for three days in the first week of June. About a thousand children come from all over the world and show their films. Um, but also at, a, at an international film festival, which is happening on Monday. So films that are made in Scotland by children are being shown at public screenings, which I think that's the only, that's the only public film festival out of all the participating countries where films are actually shown. Um, it follows a, a, a kind of curriculum, a, co a common programme. Um, uh, the, the, the French call it the va et vient, the, the coming and going between watching and making. So it's not a watch, watch, watch and then make programme. It's a watch, make, watch, make, watch, make, think, discuss, um, ar all around this, uh, this question of cinema. And the making takes the form of exercises, so there's lots of play, there's lots of trying out very simple ideas, short ideas, and then there's a, f a film essay uh, in the sense of a trying out, and an exploration, um, which is made to a common brief. So every, every child making a film follows the same brief. Um, it, in the main, it's a combination of teachers and filmmakers who work together. It's not the same everywhere like that, but that's what they try and, and maintain, a, a kind of to and fro if you like, between um, the, those, the different disciplines in, in, in film and teaching. Um, is there anything else that I need to say about it? That, uh, I think it would be just about the theme of this year, which is climate. The, the, um, the, so we're about to see, we're going to see three films, and each, after each one we'll have a little bit of a chat with... Um, Aoife and Avril, and then we'll watch another film. You get a chance to ask questions. Um, so the three films are from, the, fir the first one is from The, the Climate, which was a funny outlier, because it's not really a film aesthetic question, but it was tying in with the climate change, um, uh, the, uh, the Paris summit uh, three years ago. But still, it was about the role that the weather has played in, in the way that filmmakers tell stories. Um, so that's, let's, let's just watch that film, which is called... Get over it. Get over it. And so, so actually, so the brief. What was the brief? Can we remember the brief? 
It's, uh, it's about a, chi a, a child who has to, who find, who has a sh who has to find shelter. Um, and then there's a kind of change in the weather conditions which has an impact on the story um, and then you have to, you have to resolve uh, the, the story after the kind of the weather intervention. So it's 10 minutes long, 11 minutes long or so, isn't it? Okay.
Charlie's seen the message. I didn't mean to. I, I, I was just trying to see it. 
never really let her see the message, so she just looked over the shoulder. And I also can say uh, that I'm not gay. I'm sorry. Okay. I'm but there's no, I know you're not gay. But there's nothing wrong with being gay. Mm. I know it's hard sometimes. It is really hard. Like I wish I was like you, just a normal person. I wish I was like. But, but, but you are normal. You should be proud that you're gay. How? Because lots of people are different from others. Difference, different is good. But why does everyone bully you then? Because they've not got used to it. They, they, they don't hardly see. They just, maybe they've got experience like that. I could, I know it's hard for you. Mm -hmm. That is really hard for me. I get bullied all the time and... I'm going to stick up for you, okay? Promise? Until it's over, promise. Yeah, okay. Okay. Then... I should say so. <laughs> so Eva, Avril and Jamie will we'll have a conversation. If you've got questions as well out, out of the film, okay. um, but maybe I'll just start by asking... It's your class. Yeah, my class. So tell us something about how you... Tell us something about how you managed uh, shooting a 12... and editing and sorting out a 12-minute film with a class of... How many children? 25 children or something? 19, 19 children. Yeah. Um, so that year, we Jamie came to us on a fortnightly basis. Um, so I had kind of given, for the majority of the year, I had given over an, a full afternoon to the program. And Jamie would come one week and he would do kind of the input with them. And then the following week at the same time would be when I would have to do all the filming with them. Um, so we organized it like that at first. Um, but the benefit of it being my own class meant that I could kind of link it into other curricular areas. So later on when we started thinking about our final film, we were able to incorporate that in our writing lessons. Um, so we were kind of able to use it across different curricular areas. Um, later in the year, um, when we were trying to get those films finished and ready, um, the benefit of it being my own class meant that I could kind of give over more of the time to it as I, as I felt necessary. Um, and I had been told that because it was, although we have specific outcomes, curricular outcomes that we need to cover, I had been told that because it was kind of a unique experience for them, if I felt that I wasn't going to be able to fit specific things in, I was able to put them aside to kind of prioritize the understanding cinema, um, which was really, really helpful for me because um, any class teachers will know that your timetable is very, very tight in the year. 
so that was the structure of it. It was we had one section every once a week um, for about an hour and a half, two hours, and that's kind of the time for the majority of the year that I gave to it. And Caleb is credited with writing, directing, and shooting. Mm -hmm. You know, one man auteur, the whole the whole shebang. Mm -hmm. um, was that that was was it completely from him? And how do you how do you manage one person in the school in a group of twenty having an idea and everybody else having you know having to follow the idea? Um, well, in fact, what we did was we actually had four groups that made their own films. So it meant that they were much smaller groups, and um, because I only had nineteen children in the class, the groups were quite small, and. They all got to make a, a film, they all got to edit their film, um, but we then, as a class, agreed on one film going to Edinburgh Film House to be shown. Um, and what we did, and the reason why um, the whole class was credited, was because we, we, cho we used footage from everyone else's films in the weather footage in, in this one, so it meant that everyone had contributed, um, which was kind of, it was quite important that everyone had contributed in some way. Um, so for Caleb, he, he did write the story uh, for the group and he was the main camera person for the group. Um, so, but, but we did also have story writers for other, for other yeah. films and we had camera people for other films. And and the the the, the, perform and the the acting, the dialogue is so natural. It feels it, it improvised. It, it's kind of a, an adult, well, it's a more grown-up theme, but they're speak but they're speaking it, and not like a like a set of slogans. You know, they are actually speaking it in their own words. Well, we we actually approached that as an improvisation, effectively, and we with the actors and and uh, so me and Caleb and uh, the two actors, uh, Pontef and Declan, had a, a big chat about what that conversation might be like and kind of some things that we knew, we knew generally what we wanted the, Caleb knew what he wanted the, what feeling he wanted the scene to have, but in terms of, and we just kind of navigated our way towards that. And it, it took quite a lot of work. I mean, we, we did a lot of takes of it. And um, sometimes <laughs> the things that were said were not particularly appropriate. <laughs> And uh, we, and so, uh, but we, we came, I think we must have shot that dialogue between Pontef and Declan at the end about four or five times. And then me and Caleb and Owen, who actually had a lot of input on the editing, didn't he? We sat there and just watched all the takes and just said, we like that line, we like that line, we like that line, and then cut that together into the scene that you, that you see. Does anybody else have any... <coughs> Questions, because we'll, we're going to have a look at a couple more films, but if people have questions about this film in particular. Hi, I'm Nikki. I work with Mark at the BFI. Um, I just wondered whether there was a shot list that you'd given them, whether you told them that you need to get high angle wines, whether they, whether they had like a shopping list of shots, or whether there was something else at play with the different shots that they chose for different times. It was different approaches for different parts of the film. I mean, like, like Aoife was saying, the, a lot of the weather shots were shot in a very responsive way. Um, and largely, I wasn't there for any of that. They, uh, and as Aoife said, that those, those were shots done by the entire class, so not just by Caleb's group. And, we, and so we had material from the entire group. And, they, and I think that, that was part of a task where they were just... They were, cut, they were making short two-minute documentaries about the weather, weren't they? That was one of the exercises that Mark talked about. And so, so they were out there on their own with cameras, just, just exploring effectively. And, and I think some of the most remarkable images in the film actually come from that exercise. I think that that, that amazing shot of the tree and the little droplets came from that. And that amazing bleak kind of grey, blue-grey pavement with the rain falling on it, that came from that as well. Um, with some of the more dramatic stuff, some of it they they shot on their own, and I would help them kind of put together a shot list and think about what the coverage they would need for the scene. And then towards the end, I came in and just worked with them for a full day, and we did the most complicated bits together, which was like the scene at the end where they're talking on the bench. So it's it's kind of different different scenes, and you'll see with the next film as well, different scenes had different processes and you know, differing degrees of input from me. So sometimes I wasn't there at all and it was completely their own work and sometimes I was there trying to get them to 
they could think through what shots they needed and what coverage they needed and, and so forth. Should, should we set up the next film and say something about what the... Th the th so the theme, that was the theme of play, um, and the brief was for a, a character who who is... Are they on their own and they find themselves through play or through a moment of play? Can you remember what the brief was? It was, someone that I think, uh, it was for a character that experiences a sense of freedom, I think, through play, wasn't it? And, uh, yeah. And, and which group was it? Was it your group? So, well, it was both of ours, yeah. Um, yeah, it was both of ours. It was an after. <laughs> we both hold it. It was an after-school co club group um, that did this next film that you're about to see. Um, Say something about the how many children and ages and. So it was an after-school club group that Eve and I run. It was from primary six to primary seven. So there was eighteen children that um, that came to the club. So. You know, the benefit of that is that even though, as Aoife said, there is a lot of curricular benefits from having it in your timetable, but also doing it as an after-school club, you don't have to justify things as much and, you know, it kind of gives you a little bit more free reign over it. And also the children that come to the club are there because they want to be there and they're there because they're interested, you know, they're the ones that have signed up. Um, but then I suppose on the other hand, because it is a club, sometimes they just decide not to come. So it's, it's trying to find that balance of, yes, they're interested, but sometimes... You know, they're, they're off, yeah, yeah. Um, it's a huge commitment for them. It was every week for an hour and 15 minutes. Um, from, yeah, basically the whole year. Um, and then there were some scenes that they wanted, like to get basically a playground scene. So we had to make sure that that was at playtime or lunchtime for that to be realistic. So, you know, they were giving up playtimes and lunchtimes to film. Um, a lot of it was in their own time as well. So actually, down to the end, it really was a lot of their own commitment, um, and you can see that. I think it might be helpful as well, Mark, just to, could you tell us a wee bit about Granton as a school? Oh. Everyone, just get and kind of put it in, put the film work in context. Uh, um, so Granton is, well, it's based in North Edinburgh, um, and it's an area of multiple deprivation. Um, uh, the majority of our kids live in S I S I M D 1 and 2, which is basically targeted as the areas of most deprivation. Um, we've got a, a lot of learners with EAL, um, English as an additional language. I think it's 47%, so almost half of our learners have got English as an additional language. Um, so, you know, I think things that do come into the playground is ideas of racism and, you know, acceptance, which is the core, really, for, for this film.
Just so that you're as quiet as your book.
black on. Why are you being racist? I did nothing wrong. And then with the I did nothing wrong thing. Oh, why you have no friends? Tomorrow at school. One of the many things to love about that film is the way that it manages a, a kind of story point non-verbally. We were talking th th this afternoon and this morning about how using the, the means of cinema rather than using language um, and facial expression, nothing, everything being communicated through, through gesture. How, how did that idea get generated? Where did it come from? The the group want again. We did the same thing where we split. How, how many people did we have that year again? 18. So we we had about eighteen people, and I think we split them into four groups, didn't we? And uh, Khadija's group wanted to make a film. They were challenged to make a film which which culminated in some sort of scene of play, effectively, and they wanted to make a film which culminated in a dance off, basically. And I think the group also. <clears throat> wanted to make a film which explored some of the playground racism that Avril was talking about and they they were initially a bit uncomfortable about that and we had to have, you know we we talked a lot about that together as a group and we talked about what
Khadija would be comfortable with being in the film. And we, we also talked about what Arwen, who plays the racist bully, would be comfortable with as well, because she's quite upset having to be racist in the film, similar to in Get Over It, actually, the boys that are doing the kind of homophobic taunting uh, were also didn't didn't like that at all. So 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 we 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 kind of pieced together a narrative which kind of built up to uh, built up to a kind of da a climactic dance off. No, just um, just to add on to what Jamie said, Khadija had come from um, she yeah she well, but she was at um, another school in Edinburgh where she really had experienced. Um, racism in the playground and in the classroom so you know I think it was really important for her to try and to try and get that across. One, one of the things that's very strong about the program and that the people behind it are keen on doing is is getting children to play roles characters who are like themselves but not themselves so there's a kind of there's a steering away from children pretending to be adults in, in films so it, 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 you've said, started there something about how that might be challenging for, for, for children. How, how, do they, how, do, how do they think themselves into, into characters? How do they devise characters? Do they, do they, and do they talk about the difficulty of, of playing a character like them but not them? Um, yeah, I think, they, I think for some of them it's almost a nice opportunity to be somebody else. Um, for example, Arwen there who was very convincing as a bully and um, you know is actually a really lovely girl um, and <laughs> well that's yeah. it and um, so I think it was almost a way for her to experiment a little bit because she was able to kind of be this other person which before you know usually she, the, she would always kind of have to hold back and um, so yeah I think in that sense it was quite I think in a way it's almost role playing for them um, and experimentation um, there were, like Jamie was saying, there were children who, especially with Get Over It, um, with the homophobia, there were children who were really, really uncomfortable being caught on film and um, saying homophobic slurs. And they, and it was actually Declan who was the one who was kind of taking the bullying, who was saying, come on guys, just, you know, it's for the film, we just have to get on with it, um, who was very mature about it. Um, Brief pause for entrance of filmmakers. <laughs> no, not at all. <laughs> Can we say a, a, a couple of things about the viewing part of the of the project and the kinds of films and clips that they were watching, and then maybe just a bit of a reference to the exercises because you could see there was some work out of the exercises that was in included. So what what were they watching? What clips? Hand over to you, Jimmy. <laughs> Well, every year the Cinematheque uh, prepares a, a kind of canonic body of clips which explore the theme. So, um, and sometimes those clips are incredibly resonant and really strike, seem to strike a chord with the kids. Like in, in the first film, we get over it, um, we watched uh, The Little Fugitive a lot. And I think that had quite a, um, quite a big impact on the kids. And you can actually see it in the film. Um, the clips i say that the clips for the play year we probably used a little less i mean there were some of the some of the clips didn't feel entirely appropriate i mean that for example there was the the suicide scene from germany year zero and uh, which felt like a strange thing to be to be kind of exploring in a, in a kind of playful you know on the theme of play and so so i mean it, it you know well, there's, a, there's a lot of playing right up to the moment when he's jumped yeah. Off the, yeah. <laughs> and, and some schools well the one in, in lincolnshire actually edited out yeah, that they just cool. chopped off the ending yeah. Yeah. and made it look like it was about a teenage boy who was playing in the ruins well we, we stopped the film but they but they knew something was coming and they, our kids yeah. de were desperate to see the end of it so uh, uh yeah really interested in was thinking about how you how much leeway was there for you to bring in maybe other clips other other that you thought might um, resonate more with the kids it could be for cultural reference it could be for all sorts of reasons um, and that's part of a broader question around how you felt as the as the educator if you like or in in terms of what I'm interested in is how 
what would your process of how, for example, how early did you introduce the cameras? Did you talk about ideas and 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 thinking things through visually before giving the kids the cameras? Sometimes I know I've I've, I've worked with a, on a PhD practice with someone who did participatory documentary filmmaking with young kids, and he felt that the mistake he made was to give the cameras over too quickly because they became obsessed with the the kind of technology rather than thinking about the ideas behind that. So I'd be really interested to hear your, and, and the second part of that question is, sorry, how do you also, how do you um, enable without, um, you know, without, yeah, not dictating, but it's just inevitably you're a filmmaker and if, they, if you sit in front of a kind of a, a, a desktop with editing software, you're going to want to offer your opinion and make decisions. How do you, how do you balance that? It's tricky, I would think. Thanks, Will. Great questions. I mean, I fir firstly, I should say that, I mean, one of the strengths of the Understanding Cinema project is that the, the, ed the, the educating team is, is, there's a team of us, effectively, and we, we work very much with um, collaboratively. So, I mean, and I think that's one of the great strengths, actually, of Understanding Cinema is the dynamic between teachers and filmmakers in the classroom. And, I mean, I, I couldn't have made any of these films without Avril and Aoife, and and uh, and so it's, there's a really wonderful kind of synergy that I think that comes from collaborating, uh, certainly for me as a filmmaker, collaborating with teachers and obviously with children. Um, so, uh, in terms of in terms of can I absolutely bring in my own clips? If if uh, so, for example, we we I can't remember if we watched it at Granton, but I'd, there's a clip in Rat Catcher, which obviously is culturally closer to home, and um, is more appropriate than, than suicide. And so, uh, so absolutely, and, and Burglar in, in the Cinema Hypothesis talks about how actually the idea with this kind of clip list is actually that, that the children should be encouraged to bring, to bring their own clips in from films that, that they like, which are examples of play or weather. And that's not something that we always get round to, but I think, I think actually that's the really important thing we need to work on is actually opening up. Because often, you know, that there, are, there can be issues with, you know, the closed canon of clips that, that Burglar works with. And so I think opening that up to the students is, is very important. But just to answer the other part of your question in terms of how, how does one balance assistance without assistance kind of spilling over into telling the children what to do i mean it's 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 uh, there's no real easy answer to that i mean i think that uh, my feeling about it is that every year um the way that understanding cinema is structured um cre uh, the logistical shape of it creates certain affordances effectively and and um sometimes understanding cinema and actually the play year was a good example of this just works like a dream like the kids just totally click with the theme and um just run with that so for example with play we didn't need to really try at all did we i mean like they the kids just ran with it immediately they, they inst instinctively got into it um and a lot of it could be shot in school, so it meant that they had a lot of agency on their own. Um, the past year we've had um, has been has been a bit bit more different in that um, almost a hundred percent of the filmmakers had to take place outside of school, which puts a greater logistical pressure on things. And so, I mean, to answer your question, I mean, I always try and create the maximum amount of creative space available. In the, circum in the logistical circumstances, basically. And that kind of varies year to year. Sometimes things, as they work like a dream, and you can give the kids almost complete agency. Um, but, for example, in the, the Get Over It, the kids edited that film pretty much themselves. I kind of helped them fine-tune a few cuts. But um, it would Get Over It, uh, sorry, See You Tomorrow, we ran out of time, and so I needed to cut it uh, myself. So it kind of, it, it just varies, you know, kind of year to year, effectively. Um, I believe... Because we have our young filmmakers here, we should maybe just a few more questions and then... Well, I, I think we should move straight on to... Okay. If, if, Jamie, if you could say just a few things about, yeah. about this year's theme, about places and stories, and then if it's okay, we'll watch your film, and then maybe can you come down after your film's finished and we'll ask you some questions? <laughs> Excellent. Okay. So, so this year the, the theme was uh, place, and um, we... And so we started, I mean, again, going back to your question, well, we started talking a lot with the students in Maxine's class about um, places that were significant to them. 
and we talked about and we you know we we had kind of one eye on the logistics here again you know places that we could just about get to in the kind of 90 minutes that we had every week um and then we once we had a place and in terms of lobster catcher lobster catcher started with uh, one of valerie's memories which she can maybe tell you about once you've seen the film but we kind of we kind of built we built on valerie's memories and kind of tried to build a story and 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 valerie's uh special place was wardy bay and so again the girl the girls will be able to tell you all about this in a minute but we 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 went down about 10 times was it guys we went about 10 times we were, and we once a week we kind of went down on a on a tuesday afternoon and we got to spend usually by the time we got down there we got to spend about 25 minutes at the beach and then we had to come back again so so the film that you're about to see is kind of and, and we tried to build that into the film as well i think there's a sense of kind of uh, it's very much rooted in one particular place but there's a sense of kind of time passing and the seasons changing all right and the, the brief was that a character had a special place which they introduced uh, other characters to, and then and that kind of had to have an emotional impact uh, on the on the story and on the audience. Okay, brilliant. So let's uh, let's watch Lobster Catcher. <laughs>
It's not going to get back to normal for years and years. Okay. And if it's really stinky and it's the fish don't like it, the, the
Ja, mach ich. I'm Morgan and I was the one who was being Valerie's friend to help her to be not sad and everything. So that's me. I'm Natalia and I was the photographer and the producer. I'm Valerie and I'm like, well, the main story in it. So keep the microphone, Valerie, because Jamie said that you're that the idea came from a memory that you had. So tell us yeah. about the, me the memory and how you wanted to turn that into a piece of film. Well, we were in class and it was just, we were talking about like place and stuff. We had to get a story. And the one I chose was when me and my dad went down to the beach and a dogfish like swam in between us and stuff. So I decided to do that one. Okay. And then... Can you say something maybe between you about how you turned that idea into a film? Because that's quite a big journey to go on. Yeah. So how did you go about making that into a story? I don't really know. <laughs> <laughs> well, w one thing you did, I thought, which is, which is very clever, is that you had some of the story set in the present yeah. and you had some flashbacks. Mm -hmm. So how did you go about shooting two different times well like the present time we did it at the beginning and then i think the couple um last weeks we did the end like the flashbacks and and the, I, I guess the reason why that worked really well from my point of view is because the flashbacks were set it, it was much sunnier it was much calmer yeah um and the stuff that's set in the present you must have shot in February or March or actually it's Scotland, <laughs> April, May, um, but, uh, but for in, in a, in, when it was much colder. Yeah. Was there anything that maybe, actually you were a photographer, weren't you? Was, was there anything that was difficult about filming in those weather conditions? Can the you remember? wind. What else? <laughs> Why did that make things difficult? Because if you wanted, you couldn't really hear some of the parts that Morgan and Bally were saying. One of the things that I thought was very successful about it is there's not much talking at all. So the, all of the emotion and the, and the drama of the story is just told through pictures, really, through, through very powerful pictures. Did you decide not to have any dialogue or did you find it difficult to record the dialogue? How did you, how did you choose to make that choice? We kind of decided not to have any um, dialogue because we thought that the time that we were filming, we couldn't really hear it with the wind. Mm -hmm. we, we were, before you, I think when we were talking about the previous film, we were talking about whether children who do this project, whether they watch other films as part of the project. Did you, can you remember watching any other clips as part of this project? Did you watch anything? Can you remember? See you tomorrow. Oh, you watched oh, yeah, some? We watched the other films. Right, okay. And what did you, did you pick up ideas? What did you learn from those, from those films? I can think of one thing that you picked up from See You Tomorrow. Does every Granton film have to have cartwheels in? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, which makes, that, that's, it's great because it means that you just express your happiness or your, your, your friendship and you can do it by, by kind of tumbling and doing handstands. Um, and that's a really interesting connection between the two films. Has anybody else got any questions for our filmmakers? Congratulations, I thought that was an absolutely terrific um, film. Um, I'm just going to start with a question for Valerie. Valerie, there are quite a lot of um, close-ups of your face. Um, how, did, how did you feel about, about that? It wasn't really that bad though, because the camera isn't really that big. And that's it. <laughs> Sorry, Matt, go on. You. What, what, what were you thinking? You knew that the camera was going to be close on your face and, and you were very expressive. Yeah. And what, what, what was going through your mind? How did you prepare for those scenes? Well, Jamie just said, like, don't look at the camera and stuff. So. 
but when, but you you were doing this really great acting where you were you seem very very sad like you put a lot of emotion so how did you how did you do that how did you kind of get that emotion mm. I don't really know <laughs> <laughs> well, that was very well done mm-hmm. has anybody else yeah Andy's got that. I don't know. <coughs> hey? yeah, what we needed so that we can record Thanks so much for showing us your film. That was excellent. Really good work. And um, did you did you did you have friends that have seen the film? And have you had any reactions from your family about what you've done? Something new? Or have you ever been able to show the film yet anywhere? To uh, this, is... this is our first time seeing it. Ah, you've only just seen it. Well, all yeah. the staff in the school have seen it, but none of us have. Oh. So it was our first time watching it. Are you um, excited? And next week, uh, we're class in the P7s. Oh. are going to see it on the Monday next week, so it's going to be quite exciting. Do they know anything about the story or what you did? The class do, but yeah. not many people do. What, what did it what did it come to you to make? Um, it, uh, want to make another film? Having seen this one, having done this one, did you? Uh, yeah. What, what sort like, of film would you make now? I don't know, like maybe like something kind of like that one, like at the beach as well, but maybe like a different storyline. Now that you, you've seen it for the first time on quite a big screen, and did you look at it and think, oh, I wish I'd done that, or I should, I, could I change that? How, did, did you look at it and think, <laughs> or did you say, oh, that's exactly what we were aiming for? Well, not really, because... I don't really know. Is there nothing you've changed? Is there anything you've no. changed? Oh, you what, need a lot what, of about, what about our director of photography? Do, do you look at that and think... Maybe you could have shot this peaking again to make it more clear. Yeah. I, I, I'm, I quite, when, when filmmakers, when professional filmmakers, when they shoot the weather, they try and hide the sound of the wind. But in this film, I think it's, it's quite powerful. Do you get a sense that it's really... I, I could feel the cold because you could hear the wind. It, it was very, very loud, very noisy. So it's an example where you can actually hear the sound of the wind, and I think it adds to the, it really does add to the story. There's a bit at the end of the film where it's very quiet. Mm-hmm. Does, that feel any, does that feel important to have that in it? Um, I don't really know. <laughs> <laughs> did, did you decide to take the sound off at the end, or did that, did that happen afterwards? It was okay. Jamie. Yeah, 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 Jamie took the sound off. Yeah. Yeah. It's an intervention. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else got to? I, so, yeah. I'm uh, Valerie's father. <laughs> <laughs> you've, you've got to walk on parts of it. <laughs> Obviously, I was the best, but uh, however. Look, uh, that hit me right away was the sound. Yeah. And almost like the brashness of it all. And dare I say, when I was watching parts of it, it hearked back to. There's a Super 8 filament of yesteryear, which I do have. <laughs> but there was parts of it there, and it was, it was harsh at times, and very emotional, obviously, for me, but the sound, very much so. Yeah. I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And Super 8 film is a really old kind of technology <laughs> that people from different generations used to, used to film on. <laughs> Maybe you guys could talk a wee bit about the cameras that we use. Natalia, can you tell us a wee bit about what, what sort of camera we use? What was it like to work with and all that sort of stuff? Well, it was quite easy because it was small, so you could have it in your hand and you can have like the other one to think about the surroundings. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. And what were some of the, did you, were there ever tricky things that you found with the camera that we had to work? Well, to make it more static on the tripod when it was really windy. Yeah, absolutely. I say something. So we, the cameras that we use are very, uh, they're kind of flip vids, basically. And uh, I think right from the start, we've used the same bunch of cameras, haven't we? And I think one of the things which is great about these cameras is, as, as Natalia says, they're very small, they're kind of handheld, and they're just, you know how to use them quite quickly, don't you? Did it, did it take you a while, Natalia, until you felt confident with the camera? Not really. Yeah, you felt confident quite quickly, did you? Yeah. And what about with the tripod? Mm, the tripod was a little tricky to set up to find like the right height of things to make it look good. Yeah. Yeah. And also, like we, we did quite a lot of handheld filming, didn't we? 
tell us about tell us about some of the how was the because there were, there were quite a few scenes where you had the camera in your hand and you were following Valerie and Morgan around, weren't there? Tell us about filming those. Well, that was quite tricky because when some of like Valerie and Morgan were working faster and then slower, so you had to be right the right speed. And also, I was a little shaky when it was windy. Thanks. Congratulations again. It was a really powerful, wonderful film to watch. Um, something that I noticed was lots of your cutaways, so shots of the things that aren't your main characters, held a lot of emotion. And I just wondered whether you went around picking very carefully the different shots to take and, and what you wanted to use them for. Do you know all the shots that weren't, that weren't of Valerie, that weren't of you? There were lots of shots of the beach. So you were collecting shots, so can you say something about how you chose them and what effect you wanted to get from those shots? Well, we wanted to get, like, cool effects to get, like, people to, like, watch it more to see, like, to see, like, oh, I don't know. <laughs> well, pass it along, because you might have an idea. Um... <laughs> um, to make it kind of look natural. So, remember, where, where, what did we start doing? What was the first thing that we did at the beach? Can you remember the very first time we went to the beach? You can't remember what we did? Yeah, you tell, what was the first thing we did? We just had like a look around and stuff and we just tried to find like pretty like shots of like the water and the weather and stuff to like, start the film. Yeah, good. And what, what sort of things were we, when we were thinking about how we were going to film the place and how we wanted the place to feel, what sort of thing, can you remember what sort of things we talked about, about how to, mm. can you remember the time? No. no. <laughs> I don't know either. We, <laughs> <laughs> you remember something about when you first went to the beach, were you going to say something about that? No. <laughs> I was going to say that we took a lot of pictures to get it all into the to film. To find a good one. To find, yeah. like, yeah, to find a really good one to stand out in the film. Like so, the animals, like the yeah. bird covered in, like, litter and stuff, and the fish. Yeah. And were the, were the shots that you didn't include that you really wanted to, but you just couldn't find room for them? Were the things that you had to throw away? Yeah. Mm -hmm. There was... Yeah, when we were doing like all of the car wheels and everything, we took like 20 shots because it was pretty hard. And walking so, up and down, yeah. I felt like we walked at least a mile. <laughs> There's a famous filmmaker who says, your film isn't finished until you've thrown away your favourite shot. What, yeah. what, was, what, what, was your, what was the favourite shot that you threw away? What was the favourite shot that you kept in? What's the, the, the shot that you're really proud of that you think? Is there a, do you have a favourite shot in there? I don't know either. I actually don't know what <laughs> film I like. I know it. You know it? Yeah. There was one shot I noticed that wasn't in the film is when me and Morgan were doing cartwheels oh, over yeah. the camera. So the camera was lying ah. flat. And we did like the cartwheels and stuff and handstands over it. And me and Morgan were actually quite excited for that to be in the film. <laughs> <laughs> so why didn't you include that in the film? Uh, is that you? That's you. <laughs> okay. Have we got? Have we got one more? Yeah, from Will. Thank you. It's a really great film. Um, would you work with Jamie again? <laughs> would you give him another chance, even though he missed out the cartwheels? Do you think that's the end? <laughs> And that brings the day to the close. Uh, thank you all very much indeed for joining us. Uh, please do check out our, the inaugural edition of the Film Education Journal, which is available to read online. Features contributions from many of our speakers today. Uh, for those of you inter interested in reading a bit more about what Granton have been up to, uh, Avril and Aoife have written a case study of See You Tomorrow, which kind of goes quite in depth into kind of some of the exercises and some of the, both the benefits and the challenges of using film in the classroom. 
But uh, yeah, thank you all very much. It's been a wonderful day. We've had so many wonderful, diverse perspectives and contributions, and uh, it's been wonderful. So thank you all very much indeed. Cheers. Thank you.